بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا ولا حول ولا قوه الا بالله العلي العظيم All right the uh, the section we're on now is is extremely important because uh, the the stress sunan if you if you leave one of them then you need to do a sahu prayer uh, the two the two sujood of sahu so it's important to know these uh, reciting a surah after al fatiha in the first and second raka'ah so all the prayers have two raka'ats uh, except for the witr prayer obviously but all the prayers uh, have two raka'ats of the fard prayers and uh, and then other than Fajr they have two or four or, or uh, three or four. Maghrib has three and the other uh, have uh, four. So the once you recite the Fatiha which is a Fard uh, then you recite the Surah the first and the second surah, uh, surah after the Fatiha, and that's a Sunnah Mu'akada. Imam Malik, he, he considered it makru to, to recite parts of the Quran. So he actually, it's a full surah, which is why the Malikis, if they lead the prayer, they usually recite from the, the short surah, like from Wudduha uh, uh, to the end of the Quran is actually mustahab for the Imam to recite only from the short surah. Uh, and then the at Fajr prayer, depending on the jama'ah, it's better to pray a short, if you're leading the prayer, it's always better to short in all the madhabs. Because there's weak people, there's uh, women that uh, uh, you know have children, there's uh, old people. And uh, and so, but in Ma Ma Malik's madhab, you recite a surah. It it fulfills the obligation to do just a, uh, you know, a few verses. All right, but uh, there's a, the surah is the sunnah, uh, and all the hadith indicate that the prophet recited a complete surah in the. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, Abu Hanifa radhiyallahu took from Faqra Umati Yassara minhu. You know. The, he took from the Quran, but if you actually look at the prophetic practice, the Prophet was reading a whole surah. Mm -hmm. is, is it a surah per or for the entire surah? No, two, two, one, a, a separate surah for each rakah. Same thing after that? Same no. Mm -mm. Uh, then standing for both sur surah. So al qiyam, and then uh, reciting audibly the the uh, the jahar when it's jahar, and the sir when it's sir, and audibly means you can at least you know you you hear yourself th with your ear. So, that's audible. You know, as long as you're hearing yourself. I mean, it shouldn't you know it shouldn't be something that's uh, somebody next to you if they can't hear it. Then it's it's uh, it's sir, uh, and then saying Allahu Akbar except except the takbirat al ahram which is a fard, so you, Allahu Akbar as you move through the thing, and then each tashahud the tashahud is a sunnah muakkada, the first and the second the khuruj the salam is a fard but the tashahud is a sunnah muakkada, uh, the julus uh, sitting for the tashahud. The, the first one is a sunnah mu'akkada. The second one, you have to sit for the salam. But sitting for the tashahud is a sunnah. All right? So the second julus has a fard in it because you have to sit for the salam. But the, uh, the, the sitting, the julus, is actually a sunnah mu'akkada for both tashahud. Which is why whenever in the prayer, if you've moved into a fard, then you abandon the sunnah. And then, if it's a sunnah mu'akkada, you redress it later. So, if if, if you're, uh, you know, <coughs> if you're, um, 
if you're in your julus position, I mean the Malikis have iftirash, which is that you sit like that in all the julus position. Um, you know, I used to be able to do that a lot easier, but it's just not as easy for me to do that. So, but that is the proper Maliki position. They don't, you know, the other madhabs are like this during the the three, and then the final sitting, they do the iftirash like that. So, uh, but say you're 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 you've gone. There's your second. Uh, sujood and you're moving up if because Malik leave their hands for last if at that point you remember the julus you stay down and you go to the iftarash there's nothing on you but if you're moving up and both the knees and the hands come off you don't go back because now you've moved into a fard so you leave the sunnah you don't go back if you do go back you know it's not you haven't done uh, I mean, you stay down. But one of the problems if you're leading the prayer is a lot of people don't know that ruling. So they'll sit there, subhanallah, subhanallah. You know, and you're, you've already gone up, so you're not supposed to go back down. They think that you're supposed to go back down. Which is why it's good to have educated people. Uh, mm-hmm. Right. I see some people doing it this way. Yeah, no. It's makru to do that. No. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll get that at the end. Uh, and then uh, saying, Sami Allahu liman hamida, while rising from the bowing position, if, if one is the Imam or praying alone, Sami Allahu liman hamida. If you're if you're praying behind somebody, you don't. Right, but but you say silently, Allahumma Rabbana wa lakal hamd, and then the remaining sunan are like recommended acts in their ruling. So they're like mandubat. They are reciting the iqama. It's mandub. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Shadu an la ilaha illallah. Shadu Muhammad. And then Malik only has one qadaqamati salat, unlike the other imams. Uh, prostrating with both hands, with the tips of the toes touching the ground, and both knees. Uh, Silent attentiveness to the Imam's recitation during an audible prayer. So you should be listening. Uh, you don't have to recite. His Fatiha is Fatiha for you, not like the Shafi'i Madhab where they actually have to recite their own Fatiha. A return salam to the Imam. So Assalamu Alaikum and then Assalamu Alaikum to the Imam. And then Assalam to someone on your left, but you don't turn to the left. So, you know, the other schools, they go both sides. The Malikis, Allah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, and then uh, to, the, to the imam, and then to the person on the left, but you don't actually turn your head to the left. <sighs> Maintaining stillness after one's initial, initial obligatory composure. So you have the tu'manina that's fard, but then there's a tu'manina that is sunnah, to, you know, so that it's longer, it's not just fu fulfilling the fard, you, you've actually, you're there for, uh, you know, the time that it takes to fulfill the sunnahs of the uh, Subhan Rabbil Ala, Subhan Rabbil Ala, Subhan Rabbil Ala, Ya Muqallib al Qulub, something like that, Thabit Qalbi Ala Deenika. And then the sutra for the Imam or someone praying on his own who thinks uh, someone may pass in front of him. The sutra, you know, a sutra could be like a, a bag like that. You place it slightly to your uh, right, uh, a purse, a woman's purse. Uh, that could act as a sutra, like the chair there. But it, I mean, generally, it should be about a dhira' like that, preferably, like a dhira'. And you put, it, uh, you put it slightly so that anybody can pass. If you're in the haram, you know, the haram has a different ruling about this because of the, the numbers of people and the difficulties in moving. And on Jummah as well, it's similar. Uh, you just let people pass. In Malik's Madhab, you actually don't pray after the Jummah because it says, You know, just leave. Once the prayer is over, leave. It doesn't say, 
or something. So in Medina, they did not do that, which makes sense because people have to go back to work and they have to do, and sometimes you wait, you know, it takes a long time before people finish the uh, sunnah. And so he actually considered that makru to do that because you're, you're, you're causing difficulty for people. What I tend to tell people in the, uh, is if they're going to pray sunnah to pray on one side, you know, let people go out first and then move over to one side of the masjid. But just getting up and praying sunnah is, it's a problem because it, people really do have to go. And a lot of times the imam goes over his time, so people are late, especially here in the U.S. because uh, people have to get back to their jobs and things. Anyway, um, <clears throat> and then uh, vocalizing the uh, the first salam, so you say it, and then the second uh, and third are uh, silent. Saying that the shahud according to the narration of Umar ibn al-Khattab, which is here, uh, it's, it's in the Muwatta of Imam Malik. And he be, the reason it's sunnah to do the tahiyyah of Umar anhu is because he said it in front of all the sahaba. In, in a gathering in the masjid and nobody corrected him so it's considered like a the best sigha because it has that tawatur uh, supplicating for our prophets uh, with a salah al ibrahimiyya in the final sitting um, calling the adhan for a group that comes to an obligatory prayer in its appropriate time with the intention to gather people so it's sunnah to call the adhan for a group that comes to an obligatory prayer um, you know, there's a hadith, and some of the Manikis say because of the strength of the hadith and the blessing of it, that even if you're a shepherd out, you know, that everything t testifies for you. So even though Maliks, the purpose of the Adhan is to call people to the prayer. I give the Adhan uh, in my house because I want my kids to hear the Adhan, something I so... The adhan's a good thing, but the Maliki position is that it's there to call people. You don't just give the adhan. It's, it's, it has a function. Um, and then, uh, shortening Dhuhr, Asr, and Isha for whoever travels for Burud, 48 Arabic miles. And we'll get into that because there's a debate about what that means. The Mauritanian practice is 32 miles, which is, is a lot shorter because they go by... I mean, there's a difference of opinion it's about whether it's 2,000 or 3,500 So, um, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll deal with that when we get to there. Um, but that is a sunnah. It is not sunnah to pray the full uh, numbers if you're traveling. It's actually sunnah to shorten for 20 prayers or four days. Um, and then... Uh, he should desist from shortening the prayers when he reaches the dwellings of his town upon his return. Anyone intending to be a resident for four or more complete days in a given place during his journey must complete the prayer once they arrive to their destination without shortening it. So those are all the sunan, and the sunan and mu'akkada are eight, the eight. Uh, and then the recommended acts of the prayer, um, these are the mandubats. Turning the head slightly to the right to say salam, assalamu alaikum. Malikis don't go all the way around. Saying ameen silently after the fatiha. It's not said out loud like a lot of, uh, if you're in the masjid, you hear people go ameen. It's just said silently. Uh, for the one praying alone, whether reciting fatiha audibly or silently. For the imam, only if reciting fatiha silently. Uh, and for the follower, after he hears the recitation of Al-Fatiha from his Imam in an audible prayer, or after he completes his own recitation in a silent prayer. Saying, Rabbana wa rakil hamd, Ibn, Ibn Abi Zaid has, Allahumma Rabbana wa rakil hamd, there in the uh, Risala. So saying, Allahumma Rabbana wa rakil hamd, from, after standing from Ruku'a, for all but the Imam leading the prayer, Reciting the qunut, which is the dawn supplication, silently in the second rak'at of the subah prayer. It's mandub to recite it silently. The shafi'is recite it after the ruku'ah, the malikis before. The shafi'is recite it uh, audibly. The malikis recite it silently. The shafi'is recite the, uh, a different sirah. Uh, Allahumma, 
ولينا في من توليت right they 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 have a different sigha the 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 maliki sigha is the same as the hanafi witr qunud sigha very similar there's a slight difference so and uh, that's a that's a mandub so if you forget it you don't do the saho but it's a mandub you can also if you go into your ruku'a and you forgot to do it you can do it when you come out in in the in coming out of the ruku'a mm-hmm. Because a, a sunnah is higher than the mandub. There's a stronger... You have the stress sunnah, which is mu'akkada, which is something the Prophet never left. Uh, the, the Hanafis call it wajib. That's how strong it is. So it's, it's, it's really close to a fard. And then you have the sunnah, which is his, his uh, normative practice, which is, is strong. And then the mandub is... It's a virtuous thing, and the Prophet ﷺ did it, and it was his practice, but it doesn't have the same weight as the sunnah. That's why they're differentiating between them. So, you know, it's, if you left it, it's just not, uh, you know, it's not like leaving a sunnah. It's got a lesser, mm-hmm, yeah. N- no. The bismillah, Imam Ak doesn't recite the bismillah. Except in in Namal, if you're reading. But in the in the uh, in the um, you know, and there's two riwayah about kullu amrin la yubda'u In in one riwayah it says bi uh, bismillah, and the other it says alhamdulillah. So they're they're both uh, you know strong. And I, I think Imam Malik's position to me it's stronger. There are certain things I guarantee you. I I, I think the other madhabs are stronger about things. So it's not like to also for my medhab, you know, like, oh, it's Madiki's right all the time. Um, the, uh, the Hadith Qudsi in Al-Bukhari clearly states that Allah s- divided the Fatiha between himself and between his servant. فَإِذَا قَالَ عَبْدِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ And, and that's, that's a, in Al-Bukhari, and it, it's, it's a Hadith Qudsi, so that's a strong proof to me. The other uh, strong proof is, is the, uh, you know, the, the Sahaba, uh, you know, the practice, obviously, the Amr of Ahmad Dina, and the stronger position, because the three Imams recite, uh, the two ima- other Imams recite the, the, uh, the, uh, the Bismillah inaudibly. The Shafi'is, and don't forget, the Shafi'is sometimes is reacting to the Maliki, and not in a bad way. I'm not saying this in a negative way, but they are reacting to the Maliki because Imam Shafi'i's final madhab was in, in Egypt and the dominant opposing team in Egypt were the Malikis. So, uh, and because Imam Shafi'i was considered a student of Imam Malik's, the Malikis kind of, you know, they thought it was an upstart student. Um, that's kind of how they looked at it. So it's unfortunate, but that, that's a reality, and it wasn't always pleasant uh, in Egypt. But some of the Shafi'i positions, it's like, you know, the Bismillah. He has his delil for it, there's no doubt. I mean, I'm not in any way belittling his delil. But the delil for inaudible is stronger, in my opinion. That's why the Hanafis do it. And then the delil of Malik, which is not to recite it at all, is also strong. Um, it's not the Shay Shafi'is. They're all strong. I mean, these aren't, you know, there's reasons why they have these different positions. Mm-hmm. Um, What's that? It's silent. So the Imam doesn't recite it if he's reciting audibly. If he, then the people behind him do it. They don't. It's just done silently. I mean, you do it silently. Mm-hmm. So, and then uh, wearing a prayer shawl on one's shoulders is a is mandub. Uh, for the imam, it's stronger. He he should actually. It's a sunnah to wear it. Um, the uh, the prayer shawl is like a. Uh, uh, I mean, it's very specific how long is the sunnah to wear it, but the Prophet did wear it. 
Uh, it's something also, you know, the Jewish community wears the prayer shawl as well when they pray. So it's it's probably, you know, in the Semitic tradition uh, to do that. But um, that's for the men to wear. Uh, and all my teachers were very adamant about wearing the prayer shawl. So. And then leaving one's hands at one side, which is sadal, while standing in the prayer. Now, just to say a few things about it, uh, sadal. Sadal has been attacked by, um, you know, a lot of ignorant people in this time. If you look at the Maliki countries now, which almost all practice sadal 30 years ago, and now you almost don't see it. But uh, just to go in just quickly, I mean, I... I wrote a very extensive paper uh, on the subject, which goes into a lot of um, detail. But um, none of the imams, and this is something they never tell you, not one of the four imams considers qabal to be a sunnah. None of them. Shafi'i doesn't. Ahmed ibn Hanbal doesn't. Abu Hanifa doesn't. And Imam Malik doesn't. They all consider it, they call it minhayat al-salat except for the Malikis. In other words, it's just an outward form in the prayer. Imam Shafi'i in the Umm, which is one of his uh, most important texts, he says that, uh, that somebody praying, يَجْعَلُ يَدْهُ الْيُمْنَ عَلَى الْيُسْرَى He should put his right hand over the left hand. وَإِنْ أَرْسَلَهُمَا But if he leaves him at his side, فَلَا بَأْسَ you know, There's no harm in that. In other words, it's fine. You do either one, it doesn't really matter. So Imam Shafi'i's madhab is, this isn't a big deal. As long as he's not playing around with his hands. Uh, and if you also ask, now for something that would seem to be such an important sunnah that everybody says the other way is a bid'ah, if you ask anybody where did the Prophet put his hands, Nobody can tell you, except for the Hanafis have a weak hadith that says he put them under his belly button. And that's why the Hanafis pray with it under. But nobody can tell you where he put his hands. That's the only hadith which is, you know, it's a weak hadith. So it's funny that nobody knows where the hands were. You know, so some Shafi'is hold it over the heart. That's just an ishtihad of their imams. It's not, there's no hadith that said the Prophet put it over his heart. It's an ishtihad from their imam. Some put it here. So you see some people doing this because of فَصَلِّ لِرَبِّكَ وَنْحَرْ You know, pray to your Lord and put your hands on your nahar, which is an interpretation that is, is so rakik, you know. I mean, in Arabic it doesn't have a basis because the, the Arabs always save the most important thing for last. So it says, pray, and then put your hands on your, on your as if this is more important than the prayer. Wh whereas the, 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 the meaning of that ayah is very clear. On the Eid, salli li rabbika wanhar, go sacrifice your, you know. But anyway, some people do that. So the Hanafis do it here, which is, to me personally, if I was going to do it, that is the, even though the Manichees tend to put it here, that is the, the, the best thing there is about where he put it. But I mean, if anybody asks, if, if you're going to do Sadl, I don't, they're both uh, perfectly fine, and Sadl can cause problems in some communities. But if anybody asks, just say, where exactly did he put his hands? Give me a Sahih Hadith. So, uh, you know, the thing that upsets me is not, because to me it's not a big deal, what upsets me is the attack on the position. Because the position is very strong, it's not a weak position. Um, just a few other proofs. Mm -hmm. Qabal. Yeah. To, uh, to do Qabal. Now, just to give you an example. Mm. There's nothing in the Qur'an, I mean the only verse, so pray with your Lord and sacrifice, which is in Surah 108.2. Uh, Ibn Kathir mentions that Imam Ali 
said sacrifice means to place your right hand over your left hand on the upper chest, which I find to be dubious for a couple of reasons. Ali did sadal. The Shia all do sadal. Their imam was Ali. It's not something that they just made up. Do you know? Ja'far al-Sadiq did sadal. The riwayat on the Ahl al-Bayt are sadal. The Sunni riwayat are sadal. You know? And so the fact that Imam Ali is the one narrating this, you know, one has to wonder about that. But the, you know, the, 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 the uh, uh, Ibn Kathir says it's, it's just unsound, the narration. He actually mentions it. Despite quoting the tradition that indicates this interpretation, which is related by Daraqutni and Al-Bayhaqi, Ibn Kathir says it's, it's, it's غير صحيح. <laughs> so he relates it and then he says, it's an unsound tradition. But it's not only weak in the chain, it's rhetorically specious because Imam Ali knows Arabic better than anybody. And, and uh, you know, you don't, uh, you don't, the, the particular is added to a general statement in, in rhetoric to emphasize superiority. You know, like if you mention the angels and then you mention Jibreel, it's to show that he's higher than the angels. You don't, you don't, mention the weaker thing after the general. The particular is mentioned to emphasize. So anyway, uh, it, that, that's the only imam that's really adamant about this Shokani, which is why the Salafis uh, make it such an issue, because Shokani was, uh, but he was a Zaidi originally, so you have to understand, he was in a culture that was doing, everybody was doing Sadal, and he became a staunch follower of the Hadith. So his reaction, I mean, you have to understand the the, the, you know, the, the sociological aspects of a lot of this material. People don't like to think about this stuff, but there are realities to where people were uh, and what was going on and why they take the positions they do. Now, just uh, w the s most sound hadith of Qabal, there's, there's only one that's really strong, which is Sahad bin Sa'ad. It's related in the Muatta. It's also in Al-Bukhari. But this hadith says that the people were told to put their hands. Now, whenever you have a, uh, a passive form in hadith, madni lil majhul, it indicates uh, tamrid. You know, there's like a weakness. It doesn't have the strength of an active form, like the, the Prophet told us to do this. If it has a passive form, then you wonder why, why they put it in that. Mullah Ali al-Qari says it could have been the Prophet, it could have been the Khulafa, or it could have been the rulers that were telling people to do that. So even the Hanafi, one of the great Hanafi scholars of Hadith says, it's not clear who was telling who to do what. But I tend to, my personal, and this is my conclusion in here, I actually think it's a political thing because the two people that were leaving their hands at their sides were the people that were most resistant to the Umayyad rule. And that was the Khawarij and the, and the Shia. So it's very interesting that the thing that immediately distinguishes your political allegiance <laughs> is in the prayer. So for people to leave their hands at their sides when everybody's Umayyad, and that's why Hassan bin Ali, there's a riwaya. He says, look, I don't care what they're doing. In, in, uh, you know, this is the prayer of my, pro uh, of my grandfather. Uh, and this is the way he held his hands. Now, he, the Prophet definitely did both. There's no doubt. But the Manikis argue that this was the last practice. His last practice was leaving at his sides. So... Uh, and then the other, uh, another major proof is that the Prophet prays the outward prayer of the Khawarij. In, in, the, uh, in the Hadith in Al-Bukhari, he said, when you see them pray, you will belittle your own prayers. So he prays the outward form of the Khariji prayer. Now the other, um, the other Hadith, which is in... Uh, this hadith, which is in uh, Tirmidhi, Abu Dawood, Ibn Majah, that Abu Humaid uh, al-Sa'idi states in front of ten of the companions of the Prophet, I know the better than all of you the prayer of the Messenger of Allah. They said, how could that be when 
by Allah, you did not follow him any closer than we did, and you did not stay with him longer than us. To this he said, that's true. Then they said, well, show us then. And he then said, if the messenger of Allah stood to the prayer, he raised his hands to his shoulders. And then he said, Allahu Akbar, until all of his limbs settled in their natural resting places. And that's a sahih hadith. Mm -hmm. حَتَّى سَكَنَتَ الْجَوَارِحِ إِلَى مَوَاضِعِهَا Until they came to their natural resting places. And that's Shaykh Muhammad Abid said, the hadith uh, is a clear proof for Sadal. Because Abu Hamid is being tested and the companions would have jumped and said, no, you're wrong, he did this or that. But he didn't say, and then he put his hands over. Mm -hmm. Well, no, because, you know, the, this is practice. Manik's Madhav is about practice, and, and this, is, this is what they view the practice to be. You can do it in uh, Nafila, and that's when Imam Malik was asked about it. And he said, if, if the prayer gets long, there's no harm in putting your hand doing the Qabal. That's his position. And that's what's in the Mudawana. For people to say that his position, the Madani position of Mutarraf and Ibn Madishun is the Qabal, you know, they're not looking, I don't think. Because some of the Malikis argue this, but if you actually look at the Riwayah, they just say that Malik said, La Bas. There's no harm in it. And then again, it indicates that the Masada was not, you know, it wasn't a strong Masada. But I will say, and this is where the Malikis, where our position, about Sadal, especially that it's mashhur, is strong. And that is because the Iraqi Malikis consider the Qabal to be haram. And they're the only, uh, Malik is the only madhab that sees Qabal as haram. No other madhab sees the Sadal as haram or even makru. Do you see what I mean? So when you have a position, and the, the, the Iraqi madhab of the Malikis is very strong. I mean, these are some of the giants of Islamic history. Qadi Abd al-Wahhab, Abu Bakr al-Baqallani. I mean, these are big ulama. And they considered it pro prohibited because they said it was i'timad. And what that means, you know, it... You know, when he, when he went to the east and he read al-Bukhari and the hadith in Medina, he came back doing qabal in Mauritania. He was a young man, you know, and he's a brilliant young scholar. And he came back and that was his position. And there's Malikis that say that. There are Malikis that prefer the qabal. But, and some people complained about because nobody else did qabal in Mauritania. But, you know, Murat al-Hajj could care less what other people thought. But, uh, you know, his sheikh, some students went to him, and he told me this himself. Some students went to him, the sheikh, and said, who does he think he is, you know, doing the qabal. And uh, his, his sheikh said, just leave him alone. He, he'll, as he learns, he'll leave it. And, and that's, what he, that's what happened. You know, he, he said that he realized that the position for sadal in the madhab is much stronger than it is for qabal. And uh, that's why the, the Malikis have argued for it over the, you know, 
there's a, anyway, if you, I think if you read the, you know, inshallah, this will be out soon. There's my, uh -huh. if, if you read the argument in here, uh, it's a very strong argument. I'll just, uh, you know, to, to tell you who, okay, this is Imam Shaukani saying this, all right, so it's not, it's coming from somebody who was against the, uh, the, the Sadal. Abdullah ibn Zubair, these are the people that practice Sadal and are known in our tradition to have practiced Sadal. Abdullah ibn Zubair, who's Abdullah ibn Zubair? Does anybody know who he is? He's the first born. Right, he's first born in the Hijrah, but who's his mother? Uh, who's Asma? Exactly. So this is the son of the daughter of Abu Bakr. And Abdullah ibn Zubair did Sadal. He actually saw a man doing Qabad in the Haram when he was the governor, when he was actually the Khalifa, because for a short period of time he was the Caliph in Mecca. And, and he stopped, he was doing Tawaf and he saw a man doing Qabad and he went and he broke his hands and, and put them at his sides. And that's a riwayah thabita. So, you know, this, you have to, there were political things going on at that time. You know, it's very interesting. I mean, it's interesting that why the al Bayt. I mean, <laughs> why they all did Sadr. You know, Ja'far al-Sadiq, Musa Kalim, Baqar al-Sadr. I mean, these are the, you know, mm-hmm. What's that? Yeah. No, no. In, in the Muatta, all he does is relate the Hadith. And that's what these modern Malikis argue. The early Malikis, none of them argued that. These are people that say, oh look, the Qabal's in the Muatta. There's several Hadiths in the Muatta that he doesn't follow. He just puts them in there to show you that he knows them. There are several Hadiths where he doesn't practice what's in the Muatta. And he doesn't make any ta'liq like, this is not my madhab. He just puts it in there to let people know, I'm aware of the hadith. But in the Mudawwana, Ibn al-Qasim asked Malik, and Ibn al-Qasim is the, the most authentic voice of Malik. He asked him, what do you say about the Qabad? And he said, la arifuhu fir faridah. It's not something that I'm aware of people doing it during the faridah. And he said, but it's all right to do it uh, in the nafida if the prayer goes for a long time. And that's in Bab al-Itimad. It's in the chapter on I'timad, on relying on something in the prayer. That's where he puts it in the Muatta. So he asks him, what do you say about Qabal for, you know? Then that, some people argue that it's if it's for I'timad. But in the end, that's what it, uh, it that's the effect that it has on your hayah. So Ibn Zubair, Hassan al-Basri. Who's Hassan al-Basri? He's Tabi, but who is he? Who's his teacher? He, he was wet, wet nursed by Umm Salam, but who's his teacher? Ali. Imam Ali. <laughs> so here's Abu Bakr's daughter, his, her son, and then Imam Ali's uh, primary student, Nakha'i. Who was Nakha'i? He's the student of Ibn Abbas. All of them consider leaving the sides to be the correct position and they should not place the right hand over the left. This is Imam Shaukani, people. This isn't, I'm not, you know. This is Imam Shaukani in Nail al Awtar. Imam Noe relates that this was also the madhab of Layth ibn Sa'd. Who's Layth ibn Sa'd? He was a faqih from Egypt. They considered him, Imam Shafi'i said about Layth, kana afqah min Malik. He was more learned in fiqh than Imam Malik, but he didn't have the, the type of students that Imam Malik had. So this is the position of Layth ibn Sa'd. It's the position Al-Mahdi relates that this was the position of the, the Qasimiyya, the Nasiriyya, as well as the position of Muhammad al-Baqir from the Shia. But Muhammad al-Baqir is considered by the Sunnis to be a Sunni Imam. You know, the Shia claim him, but he's considered one of... It's the position of Ibn al-Qasim, who relates it from Imam Malik. It's also the position of Ibn Abul Hakam. It's the position... Imam, And then he says, it is uh, that uh, Imam al-Awza'i... Who was Imam al-Awza'i? 
He's the Imam of Ahl al-Sham. His madhab was one of the dominant madhabs that died out. Imam al-Awza'i said a man can choose between one or the other. He didn't prefer one over the other. He said both of them are strong. But the majority of scholars have, and this is what now what Shokani says, but the majority of their scholars have preferred clasping, and their proof is that 28 companions were of this position, and two among the tabi'een. So you can see, if, I mean, if, if you're fair about that, you can clearly see this is not some cut and dry situation of, oh, Imam Malik got his arms pulled out while he was, uh, you know, uh, being punished in Medina. I mean, this is what people say. It's total rubbish. It, and it really bothers me, you know. It just really bothers me that they belittle this position when it's a very strong uh, position. Imam Ibn Abd al-Barr, who was called Hafid al-Maghrib, that preferred Qabat from the Malikis. But in Al-Kafi, he said, uh, All of that is part of the Sunnah, to do either one or the other. That's Ibn Abd al-Barr, who preferred the Qabat. But in the Kafi, his fiqh Ahl al-Medina, he says, Either one, they're both from the Sunnah. And now, Shaukani claims that he, he only mentioned two of the Tabi'een, Imam al-Shaukani, that had this position of the ulama of the Tabi'een. And his two are uh, Hassan al-Basri and Tawus. But there's other riwayat that prove both of them actually prefer the... Uh, Tawus can be proven to have that opinion. Because... Uh, and the record of it is in the Mursal in Ibn Abidu. For Hassan is recorded to have left his hands at his side. And this is what Ibn Qudama says in Al Mughni. Ibn Qudama, the great Hamri scholar, said that Hassan al Basri prayed with his hands at his sides. I mean, this is a man who knew, you know, hundreds, if not thousands, of the Sahaba. And he's considered one of the most learned of the Tabi'een. And this is his position. According to. Uh, what's uh, related by our scholars. Now here, uh, Muhajir al Nabal said that Ibn Mubarak in his book of Zuhud says he heard Muhajir al Nabal say when asked about doing the qabat in the prayer. Whoever does that has not appropriately expressed abasement in the presence of power. And then Ibn Mubarak says, I mean, Ibn Mubarak is a student of Imam Malik. He's one of the great scholars of the Tabi'i Tabi'in. Ibn Mubarak says, and a similar opinion is reported from Ahmed ibn Hanbal. And one scholar said, this is one of the best things that I have heard. And we also relate from Bishr al-Hafi. This is Ibn al-Mubarak. Bishr al-Hafi said, for 40 years I have wanted to put my right hand over my left in prayer. So he was doing sadal, Bishr al-Hafi. I, I, I wanted to do, and the only thing that prevented me from doing so is that I would be displaying a level of fear outwardly that was not present in my heart. And that's one of the reasons why the Maliki say that it's makru because ithar al khushu'a. This is called ithar al khushu'a. When you pray, sometimes you see people praying like this. That's makru to do that because it's outwardly displaying uh, a fear. That that the, the you know you should be relaxed because the mahal al khawf is the heart. So if you what he said is that Bishr al Habi said according to Ibn al-Mubarak, that I, I prayed with my hands, I wanted to do that, but I didn't want to, do, uh, but I couldn't do it for 40 years. I didn't do it. He probably wanted to do it once, maybe just to fulfill that sunnah or something. But he said he wouldn't do it because he would be displaying outwardly a fear that was not in his heart. He worried about that. It was obviously just his piety because he, he had immense piety. So anyway, um, also Saeed ibn Jubair, who, who did the, the Sadal as well, one of the great scholars of the Tabi'een. 
I mean, many, there's many, many of these. Uh, he's, and now who, who knows Sa'id ibn Musayyib? Who, who is he? And his marasil, the marasil of Sa'id, are the strongest of, you know, when you, the, most of the ulama take his marasil of Sa'id. In other words, if he said it's a hadith, they don't, they don't mind the fact that he didn't mention the Sahaba because he was such a sound. Uh, Ibn Yazid, a Medin, uh, Medinan scholar of hadith who taught Malik said, I never once saw Sa'id ibn Musayyib clasp his right hand over his left hand in prayer. He used to leave them at his sides. Can yursiluhuma? Sa'id ibn Musayyib was no ordinary person. He, he learned from the most prominent companions of the Sahaba. Uh, uh, of the Prophet ﷺ. Imam Dhahabi says about him, he was born two years into Omar's caliphate. He saw Omar learn from Uthman, Ali, Zayd ibn Thabit, Abu Musa, Sa'ad, Aisha, Abu Huraira, as well as Ibn Abbas, Muhammad ibn Maslama, Umm Salama, and many others beside. It has been noted that he learned from Omar. He was notable in, uh, in knowledge and action, and he issued fatwas during the lifetime of the companions of the Prophet, as Zuhri and uh, Qatada, as well as many others narrate. Sa'id ibn Musayyib's own student said he never saw him put his hands together in the prayer. I mean, he's learning from all those people. So, Finally, I'll give you a little spiritual musing. Uh, you know, also just Hassan, the son of Ali, when Muhammad the Jihada mentioned the position of Sadal to Hassan bin Ali, he, he replied uh, that it's part of the prayer of the Messenger of Allah. Whoever does it, does it, and whoever does not, does not. That was Hassan bin Ali. Yeah, Sayyidina Hassan. So, um, here's what uh, Imam Abu Hafs Umar al-Sahawawardi, the Mujaddidi, uh, Freydun's great-grandfather. Here's what he said in his book, Awaraf al-Ma'arif. I thought this was quite beautiful. God, in his infinite and subtle wisdom, created the human being, honoring and dignifying him and making him the point of his contemplation, the wellspring of his revelation, the best of what is in the heaven and the earth both the spiritual as well as the material, celestial, and terrestrial. He is made in upright form of exalted spirit. His upper half from the point of the heart is the storehouse of the secrets of the heavens, and the lower half is the storehouse of the secrets of the earth. The center of his ego is in the lower half, and the center of his spiritual soul and heart is in the upper half. Hence, the pull of the ego conflicts with the pull of the spirit. So you have these two forces. That's why the, 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 the hara, you know, in... in, in Asian tradition, especially Japan, is so important because that's where, uh, that's where it's yeah, that's where it's divided. The lower self, which is stomach and genitals, is the primary pull of the lower self, and then the higher self, which is heart and intellect, are the primary pull of the upper self, right? So the spirit, the breath, is in the upper part of the body, right? And and so that 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 point, there's a pull. What he's saying is there's a pull. So the angels are pulling you up, the demons are pulling you down. The demons want you to go down, and whereas the angels are pulling you up, and the Prophet's way is a balanced way. So you're, you're balanced in your earthly life and in your celestial life, so that you're fulfilling your, you know, you fast but you eat. He said, you know, I fast but I eat also. So I have my spiritual work, but I also recognize my earthly needs. Anamu wa aqum. I sleep and I get up. Sleep is is the pull of the body, and the and the uh, right. So so he says at the time of the prayer, the battle is particularly acute due to the conflict between one's faith and one's bestial nature. That's why the shaitan comes, right? Khinzab. Does everybody know Khinzab? Khinzab. He's a shaitan, yeah. The Prophet ﷺ said, a man came to him and he said, Ya Rasulullah, inna shaitana yahulu bayni wa bayna salati wa qira'ati. Shaitan is 
preventing me from doing my prayer and my recitation of Quran. And, and he said, Daka shaytanun yuqalu lahu khinzab. That's a shaytan, his name is khinzab. So like the Prophet had knowledge of this. <laughs> SubhanAllah. So he said, if, if he comes, khinzab, you know, he's, he has a name, SubhanAllah. Yeah. But the, the ma'rifah of the Prophet is such a blessing because he knew what to do. Like most people don't know what to do. So the Sahabi went to the doctor and said, you know, I'm having this problem. And then he said, if you have that, ta'awwad, say, a'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim, and spit on your left three times. Spit. And you can defeat khinzab. So if you're, if you're finding difficulty, like doing that, just do that. Allah Akbar. So then he says, so the one praying whose heart is celestial discovers he is moving between evanescence and continuity due to the pull of his lower soul as it rises from the center. So during the prayer, the soul is moving up. Right? So there's that pull. And his limbs and their movements and activities have a relationship and balance with these inner meanings. So by placing one's right hand over one's left hand, the self is prevented from its rise. And it is this position obstructs it from elevation of its attraction. Shortly thereafter, the benefit appears due to the diminishment of compulsive thoughts and ego chatter in the prayer until the point when the spiritual powers are in complete control and possess the self from head to toe, resulting in complete intimacy, and one achieves the eye's delight and the conquest of the authority of divine witnessing. The ego becomes pliant and subdued, and it is illuminated by the spiritual center's light. At this point, the self's attraction cease. Based upon the illumination of the soul's center, he is able to perform all his acts of devotion and no longer needs to oppose his lower self or hold down these lower impulses with his hands. He can now leave his hands at his sides. And perhaps, and God knows best, this explains why it has come down to us in the traditions of the Messenger of Allah that he used to pray with his hands at his sides. And this is the position of Imam Malik also. So that's a Hanafi scholar. It's not a Maliki. Like he's saying that that is the prayer of the Arifin. Is to leave the hands at the side. Because it's a state of complete submission. That's why, um, that's why that the other uh, Imam, was, when he was asked about it, he said it's not the prayer of somebody who's in submission to God. If you're doing that, it means you're still struggling with yourself. He's saying... You know, that, that is the state of some Anyway, uh, these, these are all... <laughs> the only reason I'm really going on on this is, uh, if you're going to do it, I don't mind. But you should know it's, it's a very strong position. It's not a weak position. And two, the reason I'm adamant about it is because it's keeping a sunnah alive that people are trying to eliminate. It, within the Sunni tradition, it's still there in the Shia and the Ibaldi. The Ibaldis pray with their hands at the side also. But the Sunnis, they're trying to wipe it out. In Morocco, you don't even see people do it anymore unless you go into the villages. Like in the cities, they all do qabal now. And I went to Morocco in 1977, nobody did qabal. So that's how quickly, for, for 1,400 years, the Moroccans were, were, you know, 1,200 years, Moroccan was the center of Maliki learning. And all those centuries they were doing Sadr, and in this enlightened age of incredible scholarship and magnificent ulama that have never graced this ummah, you know, suddenly they all realized they were wrong for the last thousand years, you know, and we're the best people. All those people were wrong, and now we finally know how the Sunnah is to pray. Give me a break, you know, really, it's just too much. It's just anarchy. It's all this anarchy. You know, the, Ma the Malikis had one of the great blessings of the Malikis is that their countries had no bid'ah. You know, they were like, they, they all had the same aqidah. They had, if you went to Sudan, you went to Tunis, Libya, Algeria, it was all the same books, the same tea. They didn't have all these sex and all this fighting and all. This is all stuff that has come, you know. It's very sad. I mean, even uh, even uh, uh, Tajuddin the Sufi says there's Mubtadi'a in the Hanbali, the Shafi'i and Hanafis, but he said Allah barra al Malikiya. You know, he said Allah freed the Maliki. Imam Subki, who was a Shafi'i, and he was Shafi'i, strong Shafi'i. 
he said that Allah has freed the Malikis from the Mubtadi'ah. That's in his Mu'id al-Ni'm wa Mubid al-Naqam. Yeah, that's that's partly true. King Hassan, you know, wa rahmatullahi I mean, King Hassan uh, basically started doing qabal. Everybody did sadr before him, and uh, he did qabal, and uh, because King Hassan uh, loved hadith, he actually used to read a lot of hadith. He started Dar al uh, al Hassan, uh, you know. Dar al Hadith al Hassaniyya, you know, in fast for the study of Hadith because Hadith had died out considerably in Morocco. So he actually, but he wasn't at the level, you know, I mean, he didn't have the type of scholarship, you know, he he's definitely was muta'allim, uh, uh, he wasn't jahil. He was a hafiz of Quran, he knew Arabic very well, and he'd studied uh, fiqh and things like that, but he wasn't like a alim. And he, he did that, and that's true. But don't forget, his father had her, his wife come out without a hijab. And so the Moroccans all took their hijabs off as well. So, you know, people follow the religion of their kings. You know, so that, that happens. But, I mean, King Hassan was a scholar. I'm not going to, you know, deny that. It's... It's, uh, but, and that does have something to do, but it has more to do with the fact that all of these, uh, this literature, and I mean, you know how strong a lot of the shabab now, they, they think Maliki Madhab is all bid'ah, and right in Morocco, isn't that true? Yeah, so, they, they, and they're opposed to Sadr based on this kind of Salafi position that it's a bid'ah, but it's not a bid'ah, all you have to do is do your own research and see that many great ulama from the Sahab and Tabi'een were noted to have done this practice. And these aren't made up riwayat. These are, you know, it's not like Malik alone took this position. You know, and it's the position of his madhab. It's the position of the Iraqi Malikis. It's the position of the Egyptian Malikis. I don't know. I, I don't see why it would be. Well, it's kind of, it's pretty strong Ash'ari. But I mean, most Saudis, you know, they've lightened up a lot on the books. You can get a lot of books in Saudi that, now that you couldn't get before. So, mm-hmm. Uh -huh. So it was so strong because, like, we always thought, you know, oh, Sunnis would always be Mahabhis and Mubabhis would always be Sunnis and Mubabhis. Because even kids, you know, growing up, you know, you think it's like, oh, Well, that's what I mean. See, I think it became a political thing. Like, I really believe that. If you, if you study that early period, I think the Shia and the insurrectionists, most of them did the Sadal. And so it's just a brilliant way for rulers to kind of distinguish who's for you and who's against you. you know, whereas the Malikis maintain that tradition. But you can see all of the Imams in their words, the Qabud was not a big deal. And that's why none of them said it was Sunnah. And that's where I just take objection to these people arguing against Sadr because the Imams of the four Madhabs do not argue that point. That it's, it's, it's like this sunnah mu'akkada, or you have to do sujood as saho. None of them say you have to do if you leave it. So if it's such a, a light issue amongst them, why is there such antagonism against the sadal? Is it just because the Shia and the Ibadi do that? Is, that? is that it, because they do it? Well, they do a lot of things we do. They pray five times a day, you know. They fast Ramadan. <laughs> I mean, you know, they, 
they get most of it right. The few things that we disagree with them are not. So why is that such a big issue? And the Ibadi, who are the remnants of the Khawarij, like I said, the Prophet praised the Khariji prayer. He said, عند صراتهم تحقرون صراتكم When you see them pray, you will have contempt of your own prayer. Because they were known to have outward adherence, very strict outward adherence to the prayer. Anyway, enough said about Sada. Uh, number eight is, is saying Allahu Akbar at the beginning of each transition except after the middle sitting, in which case one says Allahu Akbar when you go up. So in, in, when, when you're praying, as you move into the next position, you begin by Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. But when you do the, uh, if you're in the second julus, so you, this is the second julus, you've done your tahiyya, then you go up and you wait until you come to composure to say Allahu Akbar. So the imam should do that and, uh, I mean the fir first julus, sorry, yeah. Good, paying attention. And then uh, closing the three lower fingers of the one's right hand during the tashahud while extending the thumb and the index finger. So you close these like, like a gun, like that, and then put the thumb there, and then you, you place it there. Some people do that, but the, the, the sunnah of the Malikis is, is that you, you place the hand there, and then... You know, some people go way overboard on this one, you know, and, and it's really distracting for other people, you know, so they, you know, literally, they do. It's, it's a very, you know, the, the Malikis, it's supposed to just the finger, um, like that, and Ibn al-Qadi Abu Bakr Ibn al-Arabi said, because the movement is in the Utbiya of the Maliki text and he said La tal tafiti la tahrika sababa fil utbiya fi inha baliya don't look at moving the finger in the utbiya because it's a baliya, it's like a calamity. So he was of the opinion that you keep it straight. Marabt al Haj it was very it was it was very slight his movement, you know, and it's it's meant it's a concentration because you're supposed to focus on the finger, it's the shahada finger, you know uh, Ibn Abi Zayd in the Shuruh, they mentioned that it's it's like a it's like a it's it's the sword of the believer, you know, it's like in the face of shaitan, that's what he says. So. <laughs> and that's the whole time. You don't stop it when you do the shahada. The moving is slight to the right and left. It's not up and down. To the right and some people do it like that. But it's actually to the right and left, and it's uh, it's um, uh, during that tashahud period. So, yeah, the whole time. And then for men, distancing the abdomen from the thighs and the elbows from the knees while prostrating. So the women have a closer, you know, they keep their body together, whereas the men they actually distance. Sitting using the appropriate sitting position during both tashahuds, which is the iftirash not the tawarruk, which is where you put the left foot on your barak. The, uh, the iftirash is to put your left foot under the other. Uh, and then uh, reciting, uh, straightening the knees without locking them. So you don't lock the knees uh, while bowing. And then firmly placing hands on the knees while bowing, reciting Fatiha and a surah when appropriate for the follower of an imam during a silent prayer, placing both hands at the ear level during prostration, so they're at the ear level in the prostration, raising the hands up to the shoulders when, while saying the takbirat al ihram, and then after that you don't, lengthening the recitation after Fatiha for the subh and dhuhr prayer in both surahs. So subh and dhuhr, if you're praying alone, uh, it's, it's uh, recommended that you lengthen the prayer, the uh, surah. So you can recite, uh, you know, Sayyidina Uthman in the Muatta, he used to recite Yusuf, 
at Subah, prayer, when he was caliph. In fact, many people in Medina, they said they memorized it uh, for that reason. And Dhuhr also, and then the other, reciting a surah of moderate length from Isha. The moderate length is, is from Abasa to Waduha. Those are the moderate length uh, surahs. And that's for Isha. And then short surahs for Asr and Maghrib, which is from Duha to the end of the Quran. Reciting a surah for the second rakat that is shorter than the first rakat for every prayer. Shortening the middle sitting so that it is shorter than the final sitting. And placing the hands on the ground before the knees while descending to prostrate. However, when rising, the knees leave the ground before the hands. All right. So the hands go down first, and then the knees when going down. And then on the way up, the, uh, the knees leave the ground, uh, and then the hands. And then... Uh, so now, uh, the discouraged, uh, discouraged acts of the, pr of the prayer. These are the makruhat. Saying Bismillah in an obligatory prayer. You can do it... In, in the Nafira, you can do the iftitahiyya, you know, the subhanakum wa bihamdika. You can do the, what the du'as that the Prophet did when he, at the outset in the Nafira. There's no karahiyya. Uh, and then you can do bismillah, you can do a'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim, bismillah rahman rahim, all of that in the uh, Nafira. But in the fard, you don't do that. And then the ta'awud also in an obligatory prayer. Prostrating on one's garment. Uh, it's makru to prostrate on, like... Uh, your scarf or your garment or something. I mean, again, prostration is a kind of, um, it's tadallul, bayni yadayillah. You know, it's humiliate not humiliating, but it's humbling yourself before God. And so, it's not encouraged to pray in the Maliki Madhab on anything that's, uh, you know, nice, fine or anything. Yeah, like, even prayer rugs, the Maliki's, if you go to Morocco, what do they have in the masjids? Then now they have plastic, but they used to have, uh, yeah, the hasir. They used to have the uh, the grass mats. No, it is. They use plastic matting now. But it used in in the older mosques they still do. But you know it's just cheaper made in China. Bring it all in. So, but the uh, the the, the meshes they the, you know in 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 the Maliki countries, they they always used uh, mats that were made out of earth, so grass mats, straw, and uh, then in the winter they would bring in carpets because there's a udhr. So they bring in the carpets in the winter because of the udhr, but generally they don't pray on carpet. Um, the Prophet's Masjid, we know, had sand in it, so they were praying on sand. Palm leaves, same thing. Sudan, all the Maliki countries traditionally used uh, earth because a sujood ala mutarafah, you know, something that is luxurious or anything is makru. And so praying on one's garment, prostrating on the folds of one's turban, prostrating on part of one's sleeve. People used to have very big sleeves. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, if it's dirty, if it's a place where people are walking all the time, like, you know, I mean, I'll put my jacket down uh, at the airport or something like that because it's dirty and people have najasa on their shoes and things. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, a lot of this is common sense, you know, you don't, if a place isn't clean. And then, I mean, you know, Prayer, prayer, prayer rugs are, are good things to have because it's praying on a clean place is, is a, a fault. And so if you're out in public places, it's better to have something, you know, a little prayer rug or something. I mean, now they have nice, tiny, little, you can carry it around. <laughs> uh, and then uh, having anything in one's mouth during the prayer, you know, like a, 
um, coin or something. People do funny things. Reciting Quran while prostrating or bowing. So Quran, it's makru to, to do Quran in either the ruku'a or the sujood. Uh, you shouldn't do the recitation of Quran. Supplicating while bowing. It's, it's makru to do du'a in the bowing position, not in the... Uh -huh. in, not in the sajda, yeah. Um, and then interlocking the fingers like this, right? Cracking the knuckles, placing the hands on the hips, closing the eyes unless for added concentration. So if you're somebody that has a hard time concentrating and you get distracted because the Prophet was asked about people who move their eyes in the prayer and he said that shaitan is stealing from their prayer. So it's better to, uh, you know, close your eyes if you need to concentrate like that than to be uh, distracted by people. Mm -hmm. um, what are we supposed to say in Ruku and in Sajda? And also, is there any sense of like, you know, like the Prophet is supposed to say, is, like, is there any sort of uh, practice of saying a du'a right before the Sajda? You do the witr uh, of Subhan Rabbil Azim, Subhan Rabbil Azim. In, uh, in, the, uh, in the ruku' or subhan rabbil azim wa bihamdihi and then so you do it uh, three one three five times like that and then when you come out uh, of the sami allahu liman hamida allahumma rabbana wa raka alhamd allahu akbar in the sajda and then the sunnah is subhan rabbil ala three times five times a witr Amount. Subhan Rabbil Ala. And then there's du'as. The Prophet Sallallahu Ya Muqadib al Qulub, Thabit Qalbi Ala Dinika wa Ta'atika, Subuhun Qudusun Rabbil Malaikati wa Ruh. You can see them in the adhkar of Imam Nawawi. There's things that the Prophet did. You can make du'a, Allahumma Gfilli wa Rahamni wa Tub Alayya. You know, whatever you want to do. I wouldn't ask for like a Mercedes or anything like that. The uh, and then Khalil adds a few other things sitting on one's two heels and I think that actually is a position I don't know but you see some in Egypt I've noticed that people do like they do the like that that's makru in, in, it's yeah it's shaitan's julus according to the hadith so Yeah, I, I mean, it's just this makro, so I, you know. Placing one, uh, feet together while standing. So the feet should be at shoulder, in line with your shoulders. And then this thing that modern, some, I mean, thank God, when I first became Muslim, it was all over, but it's definitely died down somewhat. This thing of, you know, <laughs> of putting people's, you know, uh, I mean, that's a hadith. It's, it's, it's in the uh, it's in Sahir Bukhari, and th the man that relates it was eight years old. You know, he was back with the kids, you know, and the Prophet would say <laughs> to come together, and he said they used to put their... He was eight years old. Read the Ibn Hajar's... Uh, <laughs> oh, God. You know, it's like people reading hadith and not knowing what this stuff means. You know, again, it's like 1,400 years and everybody was wrong and suddenly the illuminated Muslims come to explain to us, you know, Ya Akhi, put, don't you know you're supposed to put your, you know. It's insane. It's like a madness. You can't, no, they drive you crazy, those people. You f really, you feel like punching them. Because they're more concerned about their feet than they are about their hearts. You know, I mean, look, the, and this is another proof for Sadal that I'll show you. Because we know the, that they prayed shoulder to shoulder, right? Hadwal al mankib wal mankib. I mean, that is a sunnah. Now, look, if you put that together with another person, it's ridiculous, first of all. I mean, it's just not a sunnah. There's nothing in any of the books that say it. It's a, it's a modern bid'ah from somebody misreading a hadith from, from Nu'man. You know, you see, he was a little boy. 
He was eight years old when he recited. And, and the boys were in the very back. And the Prophet said, you know, Hadwal mankib bir mankib. You know, qadam bir qadam. In other words, line up. So they were probably back there thinking, oh, let's line, you know. And, and that's how they understood it. They were little kids. So, but if you look now, now let's both go into Qabal. See what it does? It spreads, it spreads you apart. So the shoulders aren't... So when you're like that... The if I'm like this, it's hard for you to do it. It's hard to do it, yeah. So when you're like that, the shoulders are there together, literally. But when you do that, it puts you apart. So that's another one of my proofs. <laughs> So placing feet together while standing, placing one foot above the other while standing, supplicating in other than Arabic for one who is able to speak Arabic, transporting soil of a comfortable temperature to the mosque to prostrate on. I mean, people, <laughs> you know, in winter time it would be very cold, so some of the rich people would like take, you know, or or, or it was hot, it was too hot. So because the sun was there, they would have somebody move the, the earth from a shaded area to put it where he was going to do sajda. So that's makru, to move the earth for temperature. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure they're going to have uh, heated prayer rugs pretty soon. Nobody's thought of this one yet, but you know, you'll get a little electric prayer rug. You can plug it in. It'll be heated. <laughs> somebody here is like, ka -ching. <laughs> It gets really hot. Exactly. You can't do sajda. You'll fry your forehead. It's so hot. You, you, you pretty much, yeah, put something down. I mean, they're changing that now because they're actually building the, uh, the shades. So it's all going to be shaded. It's almost done. They didn't think of that. They built the whole thing. They brought the best marble from Italy. It was cost a fortune. This marble is like the most expensive marble in the world because it doesn't absorb sun. Do you know the white marble? Because you could walk on it even at midday and it wasn't that hot. It's what they have on, around the Kaaba, same marble. So they put all that marble and then they just decided, oh, let's put the... So they dug it all up and it's all been replaced. It's just madness. Again, you know, it's really sad. And it's all money and people contracts and business deals. And, you know, Imam Malik, when the caliph asked him if he could destroy the Kaaba and build it uh, according to the... Because uh, the Prophet Sallallahu said, had my people not been newly uh, converted into Islam, I would have rebuilt the Kaaba uh, at the original... Qawaid uh, Ibrahim, because the Kaaba now is not, you know, it's less than what Ibrahim built it on. The Shadarwan, you know, that marble thing that comes out, that's the original foundations. And Imam Malik said, La tafa'al. Fa inni akhafu an yusbiha, an tusbiha al Kaabatu lu'batan bi aid al muluk. Because if you do that, it's going to become some kind of uh, entertainment for the kings. Like, every king comes, he wants to outdo the previous king that went before him, rebuild it, and tear that all down. I'm going to do mine. Because now we have the king so-and-so, and then now king so-and-so dies, and king so-and-so comes, and he says, I'm going to do it, because I want my name on the... Yeah. It's exactly what Imam Matic was worried about. Baqiyah. And then uh, supplicating while standing before recitation. So that's doing the some of the du'as that people make. Supplicating before tashahud. You can supplicate after tashahud. Supplicating after the imam has said the final salam. So once he says the final salam, you go out. Don't wait until he goes out. 
Uh, don't wait to do extra things. You know, finish your tashahud, but don't do extra things after the imam has gone out. You should go out with him. And then supplicating after the first tashahud. So at the first tashahud, you don't supplicate. You do the tashahud uh, as, as it is, and then in the second tashahud, you can do the supplication. Now, these are uh, things that invalidate the prayer. So I guess we can, we'll do that tomorrow, inshallah. <coughs> the hardest bab is the sahu, and it's kind of a long, uh, but I, alhamdulillah, I think we're getting through this. Yeah, no, I'm doing no. that. Yeah, I'm doing that. We're getting through this. I think I can finish it. Mm -hmm. Is it permissible for uh, someone else to put a sutra in front of somebody who's praying in order to connect? Yeah, no, you could. Yep, you could do that. The uh, the tahiyya that the Malikis recite, um, a tahiyya to the la, a zakiya to the la, a tayyiba to sarawa to the la, a seramu alika ayuhan nebi, warahmatullahi wa barakatu, a seramu alena wa ala ibadi lahi salihin, a shadu ala ilaha illallahu wahduhu la sharikara. وَأَشْهَدُوا أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ That's the, the one that التحيات لله الزكيات لله الطيبات والصروات لله السلام عليك أيها النبي ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام علينا وعلى عباد الله الصالحين أشهدوا أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهدوا أن مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ What time? Are there differences in the hand of the I mean, uh, just to give you the, the, the prayer, basically, you know, the feet are like shoulder length like that, which is obvious why you shouldn't be doing those things. Uh, and then you go up to the Hadwal Mankibain, right there to the shoulders. Allahu Akbar go down and then it just rests at the side and then the Malikis actually look a straight ahead uh, if you find that uh, you know um, yeah they, they don't look yeah that's why uh, one of the you know some of the setups uh, said he prayed without ever seeing the back of anybody's head meaning it was always in the first uh, prayer line you know, so it's basically you look to the horizon. Um, you know, the other methods they have molda as sujud that you look to the place of sujud. So you have to work out for yourselves what works best for you. I mean, that's the Maliki position, but if it causes concentration problems, um, and then basically, and then your head shouldn't be because that's all khushua. So your head's actually supposed to be up, like your neck. You should be in a natural. Uh, position. It shouldn't. Your head shouldn't be broken in the prayer. And then when you go down, Allahu Akbar at the outset, hands there. It's not locked like that. They, they should be uh, straight, but but uh, not locked. And then your head shouldn't be broken either. It should be like that. And then up like that. Tumaanina. And then down, you go down, hands first. And then for the, the woman, obviously does it closer together and keeps her body lower. For the man, you, you have like that. And then your hands are at the ear point. And then the iftirash is the maniki, to do the iftirash. So it would be like this in all of the sittings. You go like that. And then... Some people have feet that are better designed for this. <laughs> if you notice, like some people get all the toes going. But uh, it's a very interesting, you know, because in Chinese medicine, the, 
pineal glands here, which is the master gland. So stimulating that is like a really good, you know, it's very interesting that that's, because it's, it's definitely got some meaning of why you would put that toe. It's doing something. But in, 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 in Chinese medicine, it's actually stimulating the, the meridian for the, and the pineal gland, strengthening it. Yeah. Anyway, so that, and then you go up, you go up like that, release, and then off, back up, and that, that's pretty much the hea of the Manakis. Uh huh. Yeah, I mean, there's different things that th those are all. You know, there's things that are in the hadith and that people add. Even you know, saying That's in a Sahih hadith. It's not a Maliki thing. Some people do it. You know, I mean, I actually do that. But the reason I do it is to, to remember not to go because I, I I learned in the. Fast. You know, and I, I was with Mortan for like, I mean, consistently for almost seven years. So, praying with them all the time got me into some bad habits because they're Bedouin, you know, and they, they, they pray fast. Most of the ulama don't, the real ulama don't do that, but generally Mortanians pray fast. So, they tend to, you know, they come up, out, and they boom, they go right into the. So. Shaykh Abdullah bin Bayya, because well, the Saudis err on the other side, but it's actually, their prayer is very good. You know, the way they pray in Saudi Arabia, the, the Imams, they really take their time. It's a little too long because, you know, if you go into a masjid in Saudi Arabia, you're not going to get out for a while, <laughs> you know, which is not really fair to the people. But the, their actual, the prayer, they tend to, they're very good on just the outward form of the prayer and taking their time in each of those positions, so, which is good. So you can get into bad habits with prayer, you know, just praying too quickly. Uh, mm -hmm. well, what would be the, the proper interpretation of, of the hadith and even the strength, the strength level of the hadith? Um, the Prophet says that uh, about like you know connecting the feet that if it's if there's like um, you know any gaps like the shaitan comes between the people and put division in the hearts. Yeah, it? no, that's true. You should not gap. That's why people are, should be up like there. So it's the shoulders, not the feet. It's not the feet. Okay. Yeah, no, that that's something. You know, even even Hajjah mentions a riwayat for one that if anybody tried that today, people would get angry. And that was centuries ago. But that hadith which uh, Nu'man ibn Bishop, you know, Bishop ibn Nu'man, uh, Bashir, Nu'man ibn Bashir, he was a young boy who relates that hadith. And he said, we used to do this. That's in Sahih Bukhari. And that's what they based the whole thing on, on his uh, riwayah. But all I'm saying is, why did none of the Imams in the four Madhabs, not one of the ulama said that this is Mandu? Show me in any Madhab. Is that, did you learn Hanafi Madhab? Yeah. There's nothing. So why did they get that wrong if it's so important? Why did the four Imams all miss that one? Why is it in the Mandubat to put your feet together? Doesn't that make sense to you? I mean, it, it would see, this is something somebody 20 years ago read that hadith in, in Al-Bukhari and said, oh, people haven't been doing that for 1400 years. We need to revive the sunnah. <laughs> in Bukhari also it says that Sahaba you place their shoes by the side of their feet. So that's a proof against having the Yeah, putting the, that's a good point too. Anyway, I, it really, 
It's very distracting for people. It's just a sign of somebody who hasn't studied stuff. Or they read the wrong book. You know. But I've never seen any of the ulama that I've studied with all condemned it. And Sheikh Ali Bafagi used to get really angry. He said, what are you guys, wrestlers? Are you wrestling with your Lord? <laughs> well, why? He used to get so upset. He was an imam in, you know, in Abu Dhabi, beautiful faqih, real faqih, shafi'i. He used to get really upset. He said, what is that? Stop that. No, I've seen people literally like this, and then, like, as you move away, they move towards you. Like, <laughs> And they're like moving. correct understanding of going down to sujood with your hands first and not to me because I thought you were supposed to go down like a camel and the camel goes down on your hands first and then you that's a good point and that's why there's a khilaf about the position because some of the other men have but if you actually watch a camel because mm -hmm. I've, I've ridden camels and gone down on them when they go down they go down the camel goes down like this yeah. right and then goes like that so that's really what they're telling you. Don't, don't, as you go down, you go down there, and then down. Camel does the opposite. Camel goes down like this, and then like that, and then like that. So that's what you're being told not to do. Don't, don't do that. Do the opposite. Go down first like that, and then like that. But it's different understandings. I mean, they're looking at the same hadith and taking different understanding. But again, for me, Imam Malik's madhab, and this is what, if you, if you just understand this one piece, I think it really helps. Malik is not reading these hadiths, trying to work out what they mean. Like, don't go down like a camel. He was living, he had 600 teachers from the tabi'in. Ulama, not common people, 600 of the Tabi'in who studied with Sahaba. So he's looking at how they're praying. They saw the Sahaba praying, they saw the Prophet and pray. So it's not like Nasr al-Din al-Albani is reading hadith and trying to work out what they mean. The Prophet didn't say, Pray like you, you read in my hadith. He said, Sallu kamara etumuni usalli. Pray like you see me pray. So the prayer is taken by talaqi. It's not taken orally, it's taken visually. You, you learn from people who learn from people who learn from people, and that's this tradition. It's talaqi, it's, it's transmission. It's not trying to work it out from the books for yourself. You'll go nuts. Really, you'll go crazy. Because there's contradictory hadiths. There's, you know, I heard and I heard. You, you'll spend the rest of your life just trying to work out. And Imam Malik, a man once came to him, and, and he was from a group called the Murji'iyah, who, who were, a, you know, a sect. And Imam Malik knew to him that he was. And he said that, Ya Ba'abillah, uh, let's have a debate. And Imam Malik said, uh, why? He said, so we can search for the truth. And, and Imam Malik said, and if you uh, win, he said, then you follow me. And he said, and if I win, he said, then I follow you. And he said, what if a third comes, and then he debates us, and he beats us? And he said, then we follow him. He said, you're going to be on a new religion every day of your life. <laughs> and he just left. Because always there's going to be somebody who can argue better than you. And that's why if you're going to follow, you know, I said yesterday, don't follow any one man. When you're here in this class, you're not following me. This isn't stuff I made up. I didn't write a book, How to Pray Just Like the Prophet Prayed, by Hamza Yusuf, based on me looking through all the hadiths. I don't care how brilliant uh, of a scholar somebody is. 
There's no way one man's going to get it right. This is a, a, an effort of thousands of the greatest scholars in Islamic history looking with a methodology. They have Malik's methodology, but Malik's methodology is not his methodology. It's the methodology of the ulama he studied from. It's a group of people. So, but they've looked at each generation when they said, mm, I don't agree, and that's why you get all these differences of opinion, that's true. But then there's a normative practice, which is what the majority of scholars agreed on. And like the Sadr, yes, there are Malikis that say Qabal. Qadi Abu Bakr ibn al-Arabi, he's a strong Maliki. Qadi Ayyam, he's a strong Maliki. There are ulama from the Maliki that said Qabal. But the majority of them, the overwhelming majority, said Sadr. And that's what's in the books of the, the Metha, that the Mashur of the Metha is leaving your hands at your side. So if you do that, there's no problem. Nabas, it's fine. If you feel more comfortable about that, that's fine. Uh, if you want to follow the hadith, the hadith is there. But there are other hadiths, like I said, that if you read the literature, it's not as clear cut as it appears. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that the Prophet used to pray like, like that, mostly? That, that's like the that. Maliki position, that he prayed with his hands at his side as the last thing that he was doing. That's the Maliki position. Imam Tabarani relates a hadith uh, that the Prophet can يجعل يد اليمنى على اليسرى أو يرسلهما You know, or he left them at his side. So he did both. They're both part of the, uh, the Sunnah, like Imam uh, uh, Ibn Abdul Bar said. They're both part of the Sunnah. But the Maliki school says this is the dominant uh, position. And in the Fard, it's this is the place to leave your hands. In the Nafida, that's fine. If you want to put them there, there's no Karahiyah. But in the, uh, in the, in, in the Maliki school, it's Makru uh, to do that. Unless you're following the position of, a, a, of that that's a Rajah position, then, then there's no Karahiyah. Can you find that in the Hadith? What's that? Can you find that in the Hadith? About what? The, the, the death of the you just said yeah, no, I, I, there's no hadith that is not maqoon fihi that says the Prophet did that. All of them have problems. Every single one. I wrote, I wrote it, inshallah, uh, you know, when, when this comes out, there's a, there's a whole essay on it. You can read it, decide for yourself. I don't mind. People are fine. Do what they want. Um, mm -hmm. Is it acceptable in the Malik Madhab to make the Taslim like other people do? Like if you're leading people in prayer and they make it freak That's out? That's what I do. If I'm leading people that don't know Maliki, mm -hmm. then I do it both sides. Because people don't know that you're out of the prayer. They're like waiting. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? I mean, I, I used to do Qabal. Uh, I used to do Qabal when, when I prayed in places because people didn't know, you know, or they think you're Shia or something. But at a certain point, I just decided, you know, I'm not going to... It's a strong position, and I think uh, it's just sad to me that, that it's been so marginalized. Because none of the madhabs consider it Sunnah. None of them. Abu Hanifa doesn't consider it Sunnah. Did you learn it as a Sunnah in the prayer? It's not a sunnah. Not, not between the grasping and the actual music. We did the technique of the grasp. Uh -huh. Which was, they made an on all of the three hadiths. One was on, on the back side of the hand. Right. One was on the wrist and one was on the forearm. So they did it like this. Mm -hmm. To get all three. If there will be a little hajj. No, it's just... I, mean, that's, well, I find that a bit... It's crazy. It is. It's like... Trying to get all three rewires in there. I know, you do find it felt some pedanticism. That's true. Because they're trying to work out. That's why to me I just like the action. You know, is that the hadith, the, the beauty of Malik's madhab to me is the hadith is secondary to, to the amal. Imam Malik saying, I know there's a lot of hadiths out, and he knew them. So in his methodology, the Amr al-Hadith actually before the hadith. It comes before the hadith. 
It's the amr to him of the ulama, not of the common people. He said it's mutawatta. So the only other hadith that will uh, be equivalent is the mutawatta. And if, the, if, you know, if there's a conflict between them, which there's not in his metta, but if there was, he's still going to go with the, the amr. If it's mutawatta amongst the people of Medina. And that's why I mentioned Abu Hanifa, you know, the hadith of raising the, the hands throughout the prayer is absolutely 100% sahih. It's one of the strongest hadiths in, the, in the, 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 the collections of hadith. And it's the madhab of the Imam Shafi. That's what he does. Abu Hanifa knew the hadith and Malik knew the hadith. Neither of them used the hadith. Because Abu Hanifa said, he had a stronger, in his opinion, a stronger riwayah uh, of Ibn Mas'ud. And he said that if you put Ibn Umar and Ibn Mas'ud together, you can't, one is not less than the other in their fiqh. And then Imam Malik said, Ibn Umar relates the hadith, but he didn't practice it himself. And Imam Malik would know that because Nafi' was his teacher who was the mola of Ibn Umar. Nafi' was his primary teacher, and Nafi' studied with Ibn Umar. So if Ibn Umar relates the hadith, and yet he didn't practice it, Imam Malik said it's clear that he's relating a hadith from amana, but the hadith is not practiced. And that's why Ibn Wahbin said, and if you understand this, you'll understand a lot. Ibn Wahbin said, and he's one of the great muhadithun in the history of Islam, he said, I memorized so many hadiths, I became confused. Because there were so many contradictions. And then he said, and thank God for Laith and Malik. Because they cleared it up for him. Because he went and Laith and Malik would say, take that, don't take that. Take that, don't take that. And that it's not that they weren't sahih. It was that there was no action. Because there's, there's different one. See, you have to think of this in terms of if everything was clear. Like, if everything in Islam was just spelled out, what would happen? We wouldn't be having this class. There wouldn't be any debates. There wouldn't be any re-examining these texts, the ishtihad. This forces us to look at all this stuff and think and, and work these things out because that's... But what Allah is asking us to do it with is adab. Ikhtida. Just to have adab, not to get angry at people, not to, you know, to, to tolerate. It's teaching us. So, and that's why, that's what upsets me. It's not that somebody's, that, I'm fine with that, it's a sunnah, I don't have any problem with that. But don't tell me this isn't a sunnah, because all you're telling me is you haven't examined the text. You've just read your ulama, who happen to be muta'asibun, they're, they're, they're fanatical about their positions, and they reject the other position. Because if you study the primary text, which I did, to me, I'm like, I actually think Sadhu is stronger than Abba, personally. And, and I don't think that about all the positions of Malik. There are positions that I think are weaker. There are positions I prefer Abba Hanifa's position. But in this one, I actually think this is a stronger position, because I really believe it was the position of the family of the Prophet. You once said that you could pray with your hands on your head and It's still valid. It's my cool to do that. You know. But it's not sinful. Unless you were making fun. It's not a big, it just shows it's not a big deal. It's not like that. It's makru to do it like that. It's makru to khasa. To pray like that. Allahu Akbar. You're going to be real guys. <laughs> and also, like, what are you saying to God? if you don't study Sharia seriously. Like, if you're just praying and fasting, you know, you can get by without a medhab. But once you take it seriously, you realize that without it, you'd have to basically reinvent the wheel and just start over again. Because they did it all. And, and 
what's left is for people to learn what they did. My view is, in terms of the Mu'amadats, there needs to be a lot of revision. I believe that. In terms of Ibadat, people should just follow the Madhab. But in Mu'amadat, you know, buying and selling, marriage laws, all, all the things that relate to those, there needs to be a broadening. You can't, I think, limiting to one Madhab in a modern age is very difficult. In, in Ibadat, I don't think it's difficult at all. But in Mu'amalat, I think it's it's not really... So you, you need the ulama to start doing the majama' al-faqiyya like they're trying to do.